Without further ado, we're now going to launch into today's opening plenary panel discussion. We have got a fantastic panel, and actually I'm going to invite the panel, if you'd just like to come up to stage to take your seats. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll just quickly explain what's going to happen. So um, each of our five panelists are going to give a short three-minute-ish presentation to um, give us food for thought for a for following panel discussion. Hopefully that will do that, and it will enable me to... Um, to, to quiz them on, on their subjects, and we'll, we'll get a good discussion going. Um, and hopefully there'll be some time for some questions from the floor as well. Um, so, first up is Andrew Danza, who's an executive director at Multiplex, currently responsible for One Nine Elms and Damick Tower, two high-profile towers in, in, in London. Over 25 years of construction experience on a variety of projects, predominantly Sydney and London. Um, extensive experience includes both project management and commercial management, so a man close to my own heart. Um, and he's also actually on the jury for the um, Construction Award this year. Andrew. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, allowing me to, to speak today. Um, such a fantastic event um, in, uh, in joining you here. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to speak about today just uh, regarding tall buildings and, and from the construction side of things, how we can contribute to um, what would make an award-winning tall building. So from our side of things. Oh, right, that's right. Great. So from uh, the focus today, what, we, what I wanted to speak about was uh, the sustainability and the quality side. Um, how eff effectively we could take that from uh, the concept of sustainability and the quality to, to the completion of the building for our, for our, uh, our, our clients and, and the end user themselves. Um, sustainability, um, obviously a lot of writing there, but just, just the opportunity to make a significant and positive addition to the visual landscape. Um, that's probably one of the major uh, elements of what we're trying to achieve um, with the sustainability side. Um, obviously the, the positive impact of what we can do um, uh, in, in the, the health and the happiness of, of the types of products that we're trying to deliver um, as part of a development. Um, for us, of, of course, we're, we're trying to um, get the free exploitation of, of labour and, and preventing modern slavery in this day and age is, is quite important to us. Um, as, as a business, we, we rely heavily on our, on our supply chain um, and it's through that knowledge we try to, to talk and teach to them what we need to do to make sure that we are um, uh, not exploiting um, uh, labour around the country as we, um, as we develop projects. Um, the collaboration of ideas that bring the concepts together, uh, the well-being um, is, is a major part of what we're doing in trying to keep in mind um, the productivity of the occupants and, and the place of choice for business. Um, we really want to make this and, and the, de the developments that we do finish off a, a place of uh, of use for people to come and live and work in. Um, the next major item that we spoke about was uh, the quality, the concept of the, the end user. Um, it is completely underrated um, in the construction industry, um, especially that how we, how we really work into the, the 21st century. Um, where we are really behind the times in that, in that sense, especially with, with BIM modelling. We are heavily focused on uh, making that contribution to, to what we do and how we deliver projects. Um, to, at the end of the day, that is what we see as, a, as an opportunity, as what we can contribute to the entirety of the, uh, the, the development um, to get what is uh, best practices involved so we can deliver the best quality product we can when we complete um, the development. Um, Utilising all of these parameters of which, as I said, the, the digital space for us is very, very important. Um, so from that side of things, I think bringing the sustainability and the quality side to fruition is, is what we would like to focus on. I think that would give you the best uh, tall building. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, okay, next up, a man who probably doesn't need any introduction. Well, I'm going to give him one anyway. Uh, Carl Fender, who, of course, is a founding director of Arnie Fender Catsalidis. Um, well-established architectural practice, active throughout Australia and internationally, uh, and with a Master of Architecture from Harvard University, he spent many years, and it says here, 
not only in Australia, but London, Rome, Paris, Boston, Hong Kong, and Bangkok. It must have been tough, Carl. Um, he's been president of the Australian Institute of Architects and is a long-standing contributor to CBTBH. And for the second year running, Carl is actually chair of the best tall building jury. Carl. Thanks, Steve. Morning, everyone. Friends and colleagues, great pleasure to be back here again. Um, I've been on the uh, jury now for three years, so this is a great opportunity to share some insights into that process. And, and I would say it's a great process, and if anyone's contemplating going on a jury, go on the jury. Meet some fa fantastic people and see the best buildings possible. Uh, right. Yeah. Look, um, on the jury, one of the challenges we face is actually how to compare buildings that are tall in their own context, but perhaps not as tall as other buildings in that context. So you find yourself looking at med you know, medium, the, the lower range of tall buildings against very high buildings. So for instance, the Shanghai Tower, quite an obvious selection, um, I think it was in 2016 that it won, a uh, very, very uh, uh, super tall building, huge amount of innovation, and quite a, quite a direct choice. But how do you fairly judge a building like that against buildings like these, which are in their own way are remarkable buildings, but of course are nowhere near that height? Um, you look at Bosco Verticale taking the garden that sits in front of it up the building to create eco-climate and great uh, great spaces for people to live in, uh, that wonderful um, silo renovation by Thomas Heatherwick, added to the silo, repurposed the silo, cut spaces in the silo that you cannot, you just cannot imagine. They are the most beautiful spaces. Um, and uh, the, the Bianchi Ingalls project in New York, which really looked at the typology of a New York uh, block. Fantastic buildings. And the building like this, Torre Reforma in Mexico City by Benjamin Romano, this is a remarkable building. Not the biggest building in the world, but a remarkable building which uh, took heritage, took a heritage building and slid it across the site to create space at the ground plane to engage with the city. A building that controlled earthquake cracking. A building that created hanging floors with no columns. A building that explored the way that the, the flow and ebb of people within the building, particularly around the core. Just um, a fantastic, fantastic building. So what happened? We changed the categories, as you would. We changed them to heights rather than regions. And this is something we'll probably talk about more in the panel discussion. But at least with uh, buildings being pitted against each other for height, you don't get that disparity anymore. So we think it's much, much uh, fairer. So the jury, and the jury has been interesting every three, it changes every year, so I've had the pleasure of working with um, international uh, <coughs> professionals um, of varying backgrounds, and uh, the, the discussion is rich, um, it's impartial, it's very, uh, very focused kind of um, deliberations. We want to find the buildings that really do contribute to the typology of tall buildings. And we look at uh, the issues we look at, of course, is sustainability, water, waste, and energy, uh, mastering space for people both within the building and within the community that they exist in. Uh, we look for innovation and lateral thinking in the problem solving. Uh, and obviously that you know, structure is a, a kind of in, uh, an obvious uh, component of that. But I, I guess what we really look for is buildings which enrich the fabric of the city and buildings which embody the spirit of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, and now it's a pleasure to have someone who has actually seen a tool building development from a, a number of perspectives. Uh, Hashima uh, Hashim, an executive director of KLCC Property Holdings. She graduated from the Uni University of Nottingham in England and has more than 25 years of experience working in design consultancy, construction, property, and operations in Malaysia, as well as London and, and, and New York. 
Um, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, Hashem has been announced as a fellow of the CTUH this year, recognizing her contributions to not only the council, but the professional world, Hashima. Thank you, Steve. I'm actually working uh, for KLCC Group of Companies, which where KLCC Properties is amongst the premier developers in Malaysia. Our strength is reflected through the pro premium premises within KLCC Development, one of the largest integrated real estate development in the world, and also properties through our sister company, PJH, which is the master developer of Putrajaya, the federal administration of, uh, uh, of government of Malaysia. Together with our deep real estate knowledge, unique market understanding and insights, our strong project and property management team continuously drive to aspire a fine balance between creative and innovative design, converging uh, cultural diversity, commercial vibrancy, and sustainability living, adding to the value creation for our stakeholders. KLCC, in uh, KLCC, we create the place for all our stakeholders. Our properties within the KLCC precinct have brought people together and built a stronger sense of community where people can work, live, shop, play, meet, visit, and dine. By understanding changing market of dynamics and lifestyles and creating greater experiences, connectivity, and security, we are able to evolve and transform our destinations to the places people look forward to. KLCC Precinct is home to the iconic Petronas Twin Towers, the 100-acre integrated development has 22 commercial uh, lots surrounding a 50-acre uh, green park in the middle. Our high-quality investment portfolio comprises office towers, retail, hotels, spectacular view condominiums, convention centre and the public park in the middle. The precinct infrastructure also provides accessibility and connectivity, building to building via air-conditioned walkways. We are also proud of the fact that the precinct embodies sustainable development with centralized chill water system, solar panels, and KLCC Park being the green lung, contributing to the ecosystem of the development. KLCC has been the game changer to the city, and it being accessible and permeable through radial roads, walkways, and metro rail train. This has created significant value enhancement to the neighboring properties surrounding the development, spurring the growth of millions of square feet of commercial and residen residential built up. It underlines how other developers in the city view the importance of this iconic landmark. These are some of our buildings that won awards. The Petronas Twin Towers designed by Pelly has won the Aga Han as well as FIAPSI Award 2002 for the architecture, environmental impact and community benefits. So did the KLCC Retail Mall and adjacent Tower 3 also won FIAPSI Awards. We also won the Aga Han Award 2007 for the Petronas University designed by Fosters and Partners as setting new standards of excellence in architecture, planning, historic preservation, and landscape architecture. More recently, we have won the Cityscape Award 2018 for our office building in Putrajaya. One of the winning criteria in this modern building, designed by T.R. Hamza Architects, was built for efficiency in spatial planning and successfully expressing its green sustainability via eco-cells, vertical landscaping, and energy-efficient facade. It is in our continuous efforts 
to emphasize the importance of benchmarking and remain committed towards excellence in what we do, we take pride in winning numerous awards and recognition. Leveraging on our core competencies to build on our strength, we remain focused in our drive for value creation of supporting sustainable returns to our shareholders. Thank you. Thank you, Hashima. Okay, our fourth speaker is Mr. Thomas Ursley, who is the CEO of, of Schindler, and he's been uh, CEO since 2016, and he's a member of the Group Executive Committee since uh, 2010, also on the Board of Directors of SOFS Group, based in Switzerland, holds a degree in Business Administration from the U University of uh, Zurich. He actually joined Schindler in 1994 and has held various international functions, including responsibilities for both North Europe and China. Um, and Thomas may possess some very specialist expertise, but I can tell you that his knowledge extends way beyond that. So, Thomas. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe two uh, introductionary remarks. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an architect. I'm not very specialized in construction. I'm an accountant, sorry for this, <laughs> but I'm still a human being. Maybe the second topic, uh, I'm not a member of the jury, so don't be scared. It's probably good that I'm not a member of the jury. So this is the challenge. You have five projects and you have to select which is really worth to award or to win an award. So what is, what is it which makes a difference? What's this special, unique element? Very often people talk about latest technology, but latest technology is nothing else than what we already have. We just try to do it a little bit better. What is really a differentiator in buildings is innovation. And innovation is, if you remember, old times when you have been a small girl or a small boy, and you stand in, stand in front of something which just makes your eyes shining. Usually, when you have innovation at the beginning, you do not really understand what it means. But the more you think about it, the more you get inspired. So innovation is a key driver for people, city, and tall building development. You can imagine, working for Schindler, we love tall buildings. We love it every single day since almost 150 years. It is a fundamental element of our everybody's life. All the day we are trying to innovate, to improve, to elevate, and sometimes to escalate. So we love tall buildings. But it's not only having tall buildings. You know, the question is not how tall must I make my antenna on a building that I have the tallest building in a, in a city, it's more. So when we talk about that, what is it? Is it faster? Is it higher? Is it prouder? What is exactly the purpose to have a tall building? We should have a higher purpose we are thinking about. Now here we are in Shenzhen. A lot of people, a lot of innovation, but Shenzhen has a short, a mid, and also a long-term plan, and it's a plan about people. So we should not only think about buildings, and we should not only think about skylines, we should think about the people living in these cities and living in these buildings, families, employees, visitors. We should look at buildings through the eyes of those people and we should make sure that their lives is just a better life than before. That should be our goal. Now, how can we find such a solution? Well, you are the experts and we are only a supplier for you. We have the right team together. So the burning question is, what does it mean when we have population growth, if we have urbanization and we have demographic change? We should have more interdisciplinary, holistic views on how we can make lives better for people 
living in the city. At Schindler, we call that collaboration. You know, it's a mixture between collaboration and action. Collaboration is usually when someone like me stands in front of you and is just talking, but we have to act. Act is much more important. We have to act across the boundaries and we have to find real solutions. Solutions for people living in cities, solutions for people living in tall buildings. I think that's what we should award. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. When, when I tell people I'm a cost consultant, it often feels like an apology. So I feel an affinity with Thomas who feels he has to apologize for being a, an accountant. Right. Thank you, Thomas. Um, lastly, but certainly not least, uh, we have Mun Sun Wong, who is the joint founding director of WOHA, a very internationally acclaimed architectural practice based in Singapore. Uh, Mun Sun graduated with honors from the National University of Singapore and is a member of various design advisory panels there. Um, of course, the partnership won a large number of local and international awards, such as the 2007 Aga Khan Award for Architecture for their first tropical high-rise tower, One Mill Mine Rise in Singapore. And, of course, Woha's Oasia Tower in downtown Singapore was last year voted by the CTBH the best tall building in the world. Winsome. Thanks, Steve. Anthony Woods may not be here today, but um, his Good Morning playlist certainly is here. What makes an award-winning tall building? It must excel and makes extraordinary contribution to urban design, urbanism of the city, architecture, and structural engineering, and also achieve the highest and broadest level in sustainability and resilience. I would like to show a short video of Oasia Hotel downtown in Singapore, which was last year judged the tall building worldwide example. The jury cited that it's visually striking, stands out amongst the grey and blue high rises of Singapore, with its plant covered facade or red which connects to the green of the cityscape. Landscaping is used extensively as an architectural surface for treatment to form a major part of the development's material palette. There is a substantial commitment to outdoor communal spaces through the incorporation of sky terraces along its height. The tower provides respite and relief to the occupants, neighbours and the city. And Anthony Wood said this project won not because it incorporates green walls along the exterior, but because of its significant commitment to communal open space, terraces in the sky. There is one more criteria for me I believe is most important, an X-factor quality. An innovative and transformative quality can be a prototype or catalyst for change. Oasia Hotel Downtown is about system thinking. It achieves a green replacement of 1,100%, a comedy plot ratio of 300%. Not only does it enhance biodiversity in the built environment, it at the same time creates a biophilic quality environment for the users and the city. But more importantly, it can be a prototype and precedent for the tropical skyscraper. If system thinking can be adopted in city planning, we can tackle urban heat island effect and at the same time bring back a more vibrant biodiversity in the built environment, making our shared city more livable and our planet more resilient. Can you hear me? 
Excellent. Yes, thank you, Munsom. So we've heard quite a variety of perspectives there. Um, Carl, maybe if I just start with you, because um, you mentioned the difficulty in trying to assess very different tall buildings. And, and you were instrumental in prompting the change in categories from geographies to, to height classes. Can you just elaborate a little bit on the reasoning behind that? Um, yes, please, sure. Um, sorry, am I mic? It is now, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things we found ourselves faced with was the fact that in the smaller regions, the buildings that were shortlisted within those smaller regions, of which there was less opportunity or less choice, were then pitted against the larger regions, which had quite a lot of very, very good buildings. So there was the potential that the buildings in the small region were actually displacing buildings that may have been better in the larger regions. So that, that was one thought initially. And then, of course, as I said in that little opening gambit, um, to take a very tall tower that does all the right things in terms of um, you know, being a great contrib contribution to the typology and pitting it against a smaller building, which may even surpass, in a way, some of the contributions of the bigger building, became very vexing. Mm -hmm. So we thought that by just working within height categories, at least it's apples for apples, and um, it just, I think, makes the judging more fairer, certainly easier for the jury, and, uh, and hopefully this has a great outcome for the CTBOH going forward. I mean, it, it does show how difficult it is to compare tall buildings and also assess how good a tall building is. I mean, from your own perspectives, each of your, the panellists, how difficult is it? And is it, is it something that changes over time, Andrew? For us, I think, um, sorry, in, in construction, I think you, you see quite a significant amount of change over time. Um, it's, it's how we adapt to that change, especially from the construction side of things. I think, I think you, the innovation that Thomas was speaking about earlier is, is absolutely fundamental in what we do. Innovation is, is the key word of, of today, obviously, and, and, and from a, a construction side of things, whether it's the way we do things, or if it's conventional construction or top-down construction or, or whatever we do with with developments themselves, either way, they're, they're quite unique, quite specific to the development. I, I think we need to just adapt, we change as much as we can, um, and, and you see that quite often. So <laughs> it's about keeping, keeping evolving with, with the markets and trying to, to instigate as much as you can into a, into a new development as possible. Mm -hmm. Hashima, the, the qualities of a tool building and its surrounding estate, is it something that changes over time? Um, yes, to a certain extent. Um, for us as developers, we, um, we look for design that is innovative, creative, uh, but enhancing uh, customer experience. So that is important. For us, sustainability is a given. And, uh, you know, we go, either we go for leads, we go for uh, gold or platinum. And we, we as developers, we own the buildings, so we look for energy savings. So that, that is a given. And quality is also a given. And you could see the awards that we are uh, we're looking for is we emphasize in quality because that, in a way, indirectly, it gives the, creates the enrichment, the, the, the ambience of the area. So the quality is not just in design, architecturally, material use, but the planning as well. As I mentioned uh, earlier, what we do is we look for uh, connectivity. Mm -hmm. All our buildings, our properties are linked, uh, either underground or at, at mid-height, uh, because connectivity and creating that vibrancy is very important for us. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yes, it is, it is, uh, uh, we take it very um, seriously mm -hmm. towards quality. So connectivity, Thomas, a subject very close to your heart, and the connectivity within a building, but from your perspective, you know, what makes a good building? Does, it, and does that value perspective change? Uh, yes, the connectivity sorry, is... For Thomas, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ladies first, usually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Well, I think uh, connectivity becomes everywhere more and more important. I think it's part of our everyday life. Uh, in a building, I think uh, digitization is, you know, 10 years ago, digitization had no meaning because we did not have technology for it. Today, digitization enables you, you know, to make proper access, to communicate. In our part of the business, you know, digitization also allows you to transport people faster and in a more meaningful way within a building. Those who use elevators, they always think an elevator has to be as fast as possible. But the most time you spend to wait in front of an elevator, to have all the interim stops, which is totally annoying. So with digitization, you can have much faster transportation of people without having extraordinary speed. So I believe connectivity, connecting all the different elements in a building is absolutely crucial today. Mm -hmm. Munsum, I mean, obviously, you've designed some in incredible tall buildings. And what, what are the, the main ingredients from your perspective that, that, that make them good? And, and again, does that change over time? Do you look back at some of your designs and think, I wish I'd done this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to think that um, good design and classic design doesn't change so much. And I think the qualities remain. But I think there is... Um, certain qualities in a building that with time uh, and innovation does evolve change in tall buildings. And I think um, um, one I foresee coming very soon is actually has to do with the way vertical transportation will be, where um, you could actually be like a snake and leather rather than just going vertically. And that for me uh, will be a fundamental change in the way we would see tall buildings in future. You could also have very connected buildings and a very connected city and a connected uh, urban environment. So that, for me, drastically changed completely. But one thing I do want to highlight as a change that I would like to see coming forth in the future is that I was just reading an article in Guardian where it says that a billion birds are killed by skyscrapers in the US every year. And I think that is a tremendously shocking uh, revelation and that um, as architects and designers of tall buildings, we haven't quite grasped the uh, importance of uh, coexisting with other living creatures on Earth. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems we are having with, um, with uh, the resilience of, of uh, man. It's not the resilience of Earth. The Earth will survive, but it's mankind that would not. But I think this is something that I think um, is a little bit of a wake-up call. We should uh, consider more the other living creatures in our mm. planet as well. I, I was going to turn to the subject of innovation. It feels odd doing that, given what you just said, Munson. But you know, maybe we, we talk about innovation a lot of our, in our industry, and sometimes we don't get the basics right. Andrew, you mentioned innovation, and you showed a slide about BIM. And from my perspective, there are so many projects which don't even use BIM. So as an industry, we seem to struggle with, with, with innovating, even, even uh, using stuff that's at our disposal. What, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, from our, from our side of things, as I said earlier, from the construction industry side, I think, I think we're, we're, we're well behind the rest of the, um, the, the markets um, and other sectors. Um, I think from our side of things, the, the digitization of, of our markets and what we're doing there and, and integrating building uh, information modeling systems with BIM, um, I think that, that brings it all together um, in a far more efficient way when we're, when we're trying to develop something for the end user and, and the developers themselves. Um, you know, the word innovation, you know, thoroughly important in, in what we just want to develop within the markets and I think um, you, the use of digitization helps with that effect. I mean, from, from going from, from timber in the older days to innovation moving to concrete and steel, and then all of a sudden we're innovating to go back to timber again. So we've gone in this massive cycle, again, to, um, to bring something that we've, we've worked with for so many years and, and bring it back, and we're calling it innovation again. So mindful of that, and that's all with the sustainability side of things, we're really looking at, at what we can develop with the market and, and what we can develop as uh, the sustainability side of things, and that all comes back to the innovation for us. 
And Carl, as a designer, are, are you excited by the piece of in innovation at your disposal or frustrated by our, our lack of actually taking them up? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I agree with Munsum that um, innovation is incredibly important at a number of levels, but the basic principles of great design or appropriate design remain constant. Um, the innovation doesn't necessarily happen overnight. It doesn't, you don't wake up one morning and all of a sudden there's a whole new world. Innovation develops and so as an architect you're developing with, the, uh, the art, with, with, with what's being um, put onto the marketplace to, that we can use. So, look, it's very much a part of what we do, the materiality. <coughs> um, materials that we've often taken for granted, we now find are dangerous for many different reasons. Fire, of course, chemical outputs, those sort of things. So there's innovation in thinking about how to deal with that, how to really make buildings that contribute, that don't take, that, um, that, that can produce water can produce energy, that can take up waste and, and uh, turn that into energy. These are the sort of innovations I think that are really, really important for, um, for our planet going forward. Mm -hmm. and, and Hashimer at KLCC, obviously a, a massive development. Are you, are you innovating constantly there? Yeah, we have to be very, uh, we have to keep up with the pace, technology pace. And um, uh, and stay uh, abreast of the in innovation, but uh, with regards to construction, uh, beam is the answer for us. Schedule is very important, and quality is important. And with beam, the uh, crash analysis helps in terms of uh, you know reducing the uh, coordination um, defects at site. But what we like to also emphasize is uh, building uh, uh, IBS, industrial building uh, system, which our government is encouraging, where um, all the systems, if it's modular system, that will certainly help the jump form system, the slip form system, steel work, if it can be done off-site, fabricated, we can control the quality and at the same time actually uh, improves in the, uh, the speed of construction. Mm -hmm. Whereas for in the operation side, innovative technology for us to make our building more intelligent, up to pace, the AIs is coming in, for example, uh, at the, uh, again, it's back to the um, uh, enhancing the customer experience, where at the reception, for example, you come in rather than manually registering yourself, you can actually have a system where you can key in uh, through your handphone and you are, uh, you are in the system already and can just walk through the air gates up the lift to the floor. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we would uh, have to keep abreast of the technology and we work together with our engineers, our architects, uh, the contractors, the lift for example, uh, to enhance this uh, experience. Thomas, your, your business relies on constant innovation. And how, how difficult is that? And what, what, what do we mean by innovation? Is it attention to the detail and improving individual components, or is it the next big thing? Well, I think innovation is a continuous process, you know, to build on Carl's comment. It's not that from one day to the other uh, something has totally changed. I think innovation at the end is implementation. It's not only having an idea, it's also really to get something done which is better at the end for the people living in a city or living in a building. And there are some, some fundamental uh, uh, elements, you know, innovation never can jeopardize and never is allowed to jeopardize. One is quality, one is uh, sustainability, and maybe a third one is now uh, connected with innovation, that's integration. We are now in a, living in an ecosystem and uh, building on the points before. People don't want to have a hassle-free life in a building. They want to be able to socialize. They want to be able to communicate. And if you want to generate that in a, in a building, 
early planning is very, very important. And we see that in, in our business that if the planning is not done very properly on an early stage, you can never correct the mistakes you have done in the past. Mm -hmm. So innovation is to be clever, smart, but it's not, you know, uh, uh, it's not a revolution. It's in fact an evolutionary development. And Munson, maybe similar question to Carl as a designer, to what, to what extent does innovation help you in the, in the design of your building? And, or how frustrated are you by the lack of it? <laughs> uh, I'm not frustrated by the lack of innovation, but uh, I, I, I do, um, our office do uh, constantly innovate. But one thing I think, maybe one point to maybe note is that uh, high high rises, tall buildings is really about uh, high density. And uh, if you look at high density, it goes back to uh, cities and urban design. And I think one, one thing that hasn't quite innovated or has been catching up is really about dealing with uh, high density, high rise strategies where I think uh, city planners and uh, master developers should start thinking out of the box and start thinking how you make a more physically connected city, digitally connected city, and, uh, and not, not rely on the, the usual uh, solution of making divisions on a two-dimensional piece of land, just have roads and then parcels for sale. And I think it's time to really think of the box of creating a more human-centric, uh, a more uh, humanized kind of uh, built environment for, for, um, for end users. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk about sustainability, and when we talk about sustainability of tall buildings, we equally talk about sustainability of cities, but it's, it's such a wide subject that's very, very difficult to frame, and perhaps an unfair question, but what does sustain, a sustainable tall building mean from your own perspectives, Andrew? From, from, the, from the buildability side of things for us, uh, we, it's, it's during construction, and obviously, what we need to deliver for the end user and, and how sustainable we can make it for them. Um, and, and more than likely, you'll probably pay a little bit more at the front end during construction for, for trying to achieve um, what is a green building and, and that is sustainable in the long term. Um, so for us, it's, it's very important that we, we bring together as much of those management tools as we can during the construction process um, to deliver a better product that's, uh, that's sustainable for, for the end user. Um, you know, the Petronas Tower is a perfect example of, of something that's won so many awards on the sustainability and longevity of, of that type of development. Um, and we're looking at multiple developments like that. And I think, I think the key for us is, is selling the dream of, of what needs to be sustainable in the marketplace and how we deliver that. Um, we, we make a contribution through the construction side of things um, uh, to keep things sustainable as we go by, by sourcing correct materials and whatnot. And it comes to all the innovation you know, if you look at timber innovation and, and how that becomes sustainable, it's obviously the, the engineering behind that on, on um, cross-laminated timbers and what we can do with those and, and how that can then move into the sustainable type of um, construction that we want to deliver for the end user. So there's a, there's a lot of development around materials that, that mean a big part of the sustainability side of thing and it talks to the innovation of tall buildings. Um, and I think we'll only see that improve more and more as the years go on from our side. Thank you. Carl, same question to you. Uh, tall buildings just have such an incredible presence in the city. And traditionally, they have been, um, they've been items or components of a city that suck energy. I think that um, we've got to really look at how buildings can give back, how buildings can produce more water than they use, produce more energy than they use, um, harness waste and turn it into energy. There's, I mean, we all do our best at the moment, I suppose, with um, solar panels, intelligent glass that can take light and turn it into power, um, the fittings, the materials we use, but I think we need to go a step further and make, those, make tall buildings which have such a, an impact on the city, turn them into machines for um, making cities sustainable. There's a terrific young guy in Melbourne at the moment called Ross Harding. I just had lunch with him coincidentally the other day. 
And he's doing a, a paper, uh, uh, well, it's more than a paper, he wants to be quite active in demonstrating to city councils how they can take or, 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 or facilitate buildings becoming uh, contributors to the city. Um, and that becomes political, it becomes, uh, it's, it's to do with planning process, what are the benefits, how do you get developers to actually go that next step for capital expenditure to do some of these issues. Look, there's no doubt that the, the tall buildings, the, the real components of a city have great potential and I think we have to all really um, go that next step to mm -hmm. ensure that they're contributors. Yeah. Machines for cities. I mean, mm. Hashima at, at KLCC, I mean, Petronas Towers, obviously very iconic uh, twin towers. To what extent do they contribute to the, to the wider estate? Um, but also, in your presentation, you showed a whole mix of different uses, uh, uses across that estate. And how, is that what we mean by sustainability? Um, you know, when the vision of KLCC at that time the, uh, our Prime Minister then and now, his vision is to have a building that is uh, um, symbolic to our culture and heredity, um, hier uh, heredity really, but at the same time a forward-looking nation. And by meaning forward-looking nation is to put us also on the same as a global player. This is way back in 1990, 1990. And part of that, together with our local culture, architectural, handicrafts, etc., but it ties in being the building being an intelligent building. And intelligent be building by means meaning <coughs> that it has to be uh, smart in terms of energy savings and uh, in those days, we were already looking at ways of, because we own the building, we're going to operate the building, so it's only uh, prudent that we look into life cycle costing, for example. The capital cost may be high at the start, but over long term, we don't necessarily buy the cheapest equipment, etc. So we will look at the life cycle costing, the efficiency of the equipment, etc. So in terms of um, green energy, uh, that for us, it is, it is in our culture already, uh, in our design, we ask for that and we find that the tenants that we have in the, in the building are actually, the policy is to have a green building nowadays. They wouldn't go anywhere else unless the building is green. So they helped. In terms of the community, because our buildings, as I said in the slide, uh, is about people and it's about creating the place, meaning that uh, people want to come. The connectivity is there, the sustainability, the, the uh, security is there. And by having this, the place to come, it actually, and because of the connectivity, it actually spurs the uh, growth in the periphery, the outside of our development. And then that in itself is helping in the economic is a nation building to us, part, partly. And um, the park in the middle, uh, the hundred, our site is 100 acres, half of it is dedicated to park, and we encourage the public to come and actually enjoy the park as part of our community uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. so. you, 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 I think you mentioned the word brand in your presentation. To what extent are the towers the brand which has encouraged that, that yeah. further development? Yeah, the, the brand. Earlier, I showed the awards that we're getting. Getting awards is not our primary focus, of course. Although we uh, like to benchmark ourselves um, with the international, even local standards in our property industry. And uh, we are committed towards excellence in whatever we do. And by winning this awards and recognition actually um, enhances our uh, or assures confidence in our investors, yeah? which helps in our economic growth and for our development. So the branding is important. 
for us uh, because with this it helps um, to promote KLCC mm -hmm. and for indirectly it will help people or will make people to come to our development because of the branding mm -hmm. and it's uh, the address the office address that they want to have mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you I'm going to open this out to the floor in a few minutes so think about your questions now um, but Thomas sustainability from your perspective what does it mean well, there are in fact uh, two different elements or two different phases. Uh, one phase is during the construction phase. You know, sustainability has a lot to do with people, so it is, can they work safe? Can they work and achieve a high quality? Because if you don't achieve a high quality during construction, the operation afterwards is uh, uh, much more difficult. But it also means speed. You know, sustainability has a lot to do with speed. The faster you can do something, the better it is, in fact, because you have less consumption, less interruption uh, 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 for people living around. And then the second phase for us is, of course, operation. I think every, everybody needs uh, 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 green uh, uh, elevators, uh, recuperable uh, uh, machines, energy reduction. But it's sustainability for me also has to do how can you connect people not only between an elevator and, uh, and the passenger, but also cities have to become much more connected. Infrastructure has to be connected with a building so that, the, that the, the transit management of people is seamless. I think that also increases sustainability of buildings. So for us, on, on the one side, it is a construction topic, and on the other side, it is an operation topic. Mm -hmm. And Munson, when people look at Oasia Tower, and they, they, they see the planting, amongst other things, and they think of the word sustainability, but I'm sure you'll say it's much more than that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, it's a broad term, and I think you can tackle sustainability from many angles. But I do like uh, Carl's uh, uh, phrasing as uh, the skyscraper is a machine. And I, and I do personally think that um, we can keep pushing the limits of skyscrapers but not how tall it goes, but how hard we make it work. And I think um, the idea of sustainability at the end of the day must be self-sufficiency. So if we could drive um, skyscrapers to generate sufficient energy for its own use, or to harvest and recycle water for its own use, and even go further, that you consider a more mixed-use environment where offices have homes have even urban farms and community farms in it that generate food. So instead of seeing a skyscraper as just a mono use, if we can look at it as a multiple, uh, many purposes use, I think the, um, uh, we will achieve a better term uh, of sustainability and resilience for uh, a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? Do we have any roving, roving mics? We do have at least two questions, I can see. Ron. Is this on? <clears throat> Hello. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, Ron Clemensic, past chair of the council. Uh, I'd like to put uh, the jury on the spot. If you look back over the last year, what's the one single most interesting, intriguing innovation that you've run across that you can see impacting your future business? Okay, what is the one single most interesting innovation you've seen over the past year? Who would like to start with that one? Carl. Uh, hello? Hello? Yep. Yes. Um, I think um, w when I first came onto the um, jury, um, the greening of the buildings was just really, really important to the jury. It was just taking a tall building to a whole other direction. We've, we've thought of tall buildings as being glass buildings or balconied buildings or whatever, but the idea of um, taking um, uh, planting up the building to create microclimates, to create great facility for the people within and without. The work of WOHA has been um, uh, absolutely at the forefront, um, particularly in Singapore, the work they've been doing there, the carving out of buildings, 
to have sky gardens, sky pools. Um, th this sort of reinterpretation of what a tall building can be, I think, has been uh, remarkable. Anyone else? Yeah. Hashima. For me, uh, I think the architects are very uh, innovative and they can be very creative. But for us, in terms of uh, the innovative that for in the past year is more towards the engineering side because it's more of, uh, for us, it's energy savings. And to have this uh, energy management system and uh, to incorporate the overall control system for the building, that helps us in terms of, obviously, the, the, the savings in our utility in, in energy and also in our operations, whereby rather than have many control rooms, you have one integrated control room, and hence I have less, we, we just need a few less uh, uh, operators to manage that, and imagine that over long term. And at the same time, it gives uh, a very quick response to our tenants, should there be you know, new requirement, because our tenants is always, we find that their, their needs are always evolving, and uh, we have to keep pace with that. And with having this engineering uh, M management system, it helps us a lot. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Of course, a little bit unfair because we are also running for one of the innovation awards. So I will skip that one. But if you look outside, there is a booth, <laughs> so maybe you have a look at it. I think green is very important because it just makes life more enjoyable. I think that's, that's one big element. But the one which has... Uh, uh, which I saw in the last 12 months is the topic of integration with building apps. It's in the usage of buildings. It's incredible what kind of a development we see from uh, tall buildings, what kind of information you have. People don't have to use anymore different type of apps or accesses. It's all on one single app. Everybody's integrated into this. And so, it starts to generate a, a new way of living, working, and moving in a, in a building or in a complex of buildings, in fact. And I think this is the, the biggest development I have seen personally, also as a user, uh, in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. I, I think for me, um, it was uh, realizing the change in the way lift and escalators can work in the future. So, um, which is very mind-boggling if you think of it architecturally and also from an urban design point of view, where traditionally you think of only vertical towers with, with the core going straight up. Um, now you could have just a couple of uh, cores, but they could actually wind around uh, vertically, horizontally, even slanting in, in whatever configuration that you can get out of it. And I think not only with the smart technology and digitization, the effective use of one single uh, core for the lift could be used in many ways. Um, it's almost as if you are creating a transportation mm -hmm. conduit within buildings now or in urban design. And I think that, for me, unlocks so much potential that we can actually see a completely different city, mm -hmm. uh, not so soon, but maybe 10, 20 years even 30 years down the road, you will have fundamentally different kind of... Uh